Week two of the college football season, it is upon us here, and we've got big games starting on Friday night. We're going to talk about the Duke Blue Devils and whether or not uh, they'll be able to uh, continue their uh, their quest to uh, mediocrity. Uh, how about uh, BYU, SMU? How about Texas and Michigan? How about Oklahoma State, Arkansas? Hell, we'll even... Mix in a little SEC. Why? Because Drew Martin is here and nobody does the SEC like Drew Martin. Uh, so we'll have him ready to roll here with Kentucky and South Carolina as we bring in the three gentlemen here. Ralph Michaels in the house. Drew Martin bets ready to roll here. And uh, let us kick it off there, Ralph, because nothing like a little uh, a little Friday football to get it going here. BYU taking on SMU. Uh, what do we do? Two teams in a new conference. What do you think we're going to get here? You know, Joe, I did a lot of videos and I talked a lot about a team having a game under their belt. And most people think that's an advantage, but it really isn't. It's actually a negative ATS number because there's an overreaction. But this has been true. The overreaction goes away after week one. So we have a situation here where SMU is playing their third game and BYU is only playing their second. When I went back to the database and looking at home favorites playing game number three against a team playing only two games, they have gone 59.2% with over 150 games of sample size. When they are a favorite of eight or more, it goes to 59.5%, and listen to this. If their opponent is off an FCS game, so they have not played any true competition, and there's a high total of 42 or more, those teams like SMU have gone 65.7%. Now that all says I should be backing SMU here, but I just can't get there. These two played a couple years ago in the New Mexico in 2022. The Cougars hung on for a 24-23 victory. They stopped SMU uh, on basically the last play of the game on a two-point conversion to secure the victory. Under Rhett Lashley, SMU is 10-0 um, straight up and 7-3 as a favorite of minus 17 or more, but as a smaller favorite or a dog, they're only 6-12 and 12 against the spread. That is reason number one that I'm not on this play. Reason number two, you look at Preston Stone. I mean, he had to look at the schedule and go, oh, my God, I'm going to be in the Heisman chase after starting against Nevada and then hosting Houston Christian. He was 17 of 30, folks. That is 57% with only an 8.5 yards per attempt average against two of the weakest foes, against the two weakest foes by far, he will play the entire situation. So game three versus game two is an edge, but I don't want to lay 11 and a half with this total against the BYU team. Again, they haven't been great as a dog under Shiitake the last three years as an away dog or small away favorite. They're only three and eight straight up and ATS. I lean SMU. I think the line is a bit inflated. And uh, this is a game where I will look under first quarter, first half. That's probably my strongest take on the game. Preston Stone, yes, he will come out of his mini slump. Yes, he will see uh, a lot of good numbers moving forward. But remember, this BYU team, while they aren't greatly experienced, I mean, they do... Um, you look at their returning starters, they have 14 returning starters. But remember, all those kids went on missions, and it's a very experienced BYU team. I like SMU. I like the numbers of three against two. But the way they've started the season is enough to keep me off laying double digits. All right. Not uh, not interested in double digits is uh, Ralph Michaels, and uh, can't blame him in this spot here. It'll be interesting uh, to see what we get out of both of those two teams here. That's coming up on Friday. But, Drew, we got a little SEC football coming up here, my man. Looking forward to this uh, Kentucky and South Carolina game. I think Kentucky's got one of the best defenses in the country. I, I think they're a top-ten defense without a doubt. 
And I do think, uh, well, I, I do think that the quarterback player, Kentucky, is going to be an improvement over what it was last year. So how do you see South Carolina taking on Kentucky here this week? Sure, Joe. I agree with uh, what you're laying down there. And I mean, talk about a, a big game in the SEC. I mean, arguably, in my opinion, it is the biggest game of the SEC this week. I mean, it gets the 3.30 Eastern time slot on ABC. And uh, South Carolina-Kentucky has started to become a pretty good rivalry here, Joe. And you speak towards defense. I mean, I, I think you could make the argument, you know, Kentucky at top 20, possibly even top 10. Or why not? Week one, they held Southern Miss to zero points. Now, granted, it was called early, what, 35, 40 minutes into the game uh, due to a weather delay. But, I mean, it speaks towards Mark Stoops, their head coach. Now that Nick Saban is gone from Alabama, who would have thought the longest tenured head coach in the SEC conference it's the Kentucky football head coach, Mark Stoops. And when you keep a job that long in this conference, I mean, think about how many head coaches are already on the hot seat, even two, three years into it. Uh, you're doing something right. And he's got a good football team here in Lexington. You speak towards the quarterback, Brock Vandegrift. Uh, he transferred from Georgia. So if you're transferring from Georgia, hey, if Georgia gave you a scholarship, you must be pretty good. I got a stat here from Mark Lawrence that I, that makes me look towards Kentucky, Joe. And it's the Wildcats are 15 and 0 against the spread when they come off of a non-conference win and they're facing a team with a 500 win percentage or better. And it speaks towards his coaching ability. Sure enough, in week in week one, you're not wanting to show everything, and then you come back week two and you smash your opponent. That's what a good coach does. And it's not like Kentucky didn't smash their first opponent, but it, it comes to speak that in this role, they have been a profitable bet. Talking about the Gamecocks, I mean, if you're looking for points on South Carolina, they have won the last two against Kentucky, some in surprising fashion here. And in week one, they went up against Old Dominion, you know, a, a kind of a close regional, uh, maybe little brother versus big brother type of thing. They didn't look good, though. They actually got outgained. They only won 23 to 19, didn't come anywhere close to covering the three touchdowns, and they were plus three in turnover margin. They actually should have lost that game. Shane Beaver, sometimes, some people are already talking that he is on the hot seat. On the hot seat. Speaking of uh, SEC coaches already feeling the heat. I'll tell you, Joe, this number was a lot less in, in the look ahead lines. You know how uh, the sports books there put out kind of like the bigger matchups later in the season. So now we're getting Kentucky minus double digits here. They're going to have to win by uh, 10 or more. It makes me uh, doubt it a little bit, but I'll tell you, I'm, I'm a believer in this Kentucky team. I really am, Joe. It's tough to lay 10 with 42 and a half being the total, but I think Kentucky gets it done. I, I see this one something like maybe, I don't know, 31 13 something in that nature and i think kentucky uh comes out on top here so uh i would go with big blue in in lexington joe oh going with big uh blue there yeah tough place to play too and i'm uh i'm kind of with you there drew i think uh it is big blue this year which might be a pretty good uh pretty good spot to look to upset uh a team or two along the way this year uh because defense we know it travels there, uh, Drew. And we also have, let's not forget, we got another game uh, coming up this uh, this weekend with one of my favorite teams, and Ralph Michaels knows this, but the uh, Oklahoma State Cowboys at home taking on Arkansas. And you got to love it, Ralph. Uh, a lot of people didn't realize that Bobby Petrino is back in Arkansas. Yes, he is actually calling plays. I'm not sure if he's allowed anywhere near the volleyball team, uh, but I will tell you that he is without a doubt calling offensive plays for Arkansas, and they put up a uh, boatload of points last week against the Sisters of the Poor. We know this. Uh, 18 starters returning from last year for Oklahoma State, guys. 18. Uh, all five offensive linemen have returned uh they laid it down there no problem in that first week uh win there against south dakota state ollie gordon bowman the quarterback there are points coming here uh and i have no idea um whether oklahoma state is going to win by double digits or not which i think is what you have to assume if you're going to lay the eight here but i do think Points are coming here. Uh, 60 and a half is what we're seeing as the total. 
Uh, I, Ralph, I could be crazy here, but I do think Arkansas is going to have some success moving the ball against this uh, Oklahoma State defense, which is a work in progress. But I know Oklahoma State is going to have success scoring and driving in this one. It feels like a dead over to me, and I don't think that should surprise anybody. But I'd be shocked if Oklahoma State doesn't drop at least 30 points in this game. So it would be nothing but an over for me, Ralph. Uh, and Bobby Petrino back in the house in, uh, in Arkansas. It's kind of hard to believe, but uh, I, I do think Arkansas is going to have its ups and downs this year. Joe, I mean, Bobby Petrino is the greatest OC in the history of college football. 70 points, 687 yep. yards, 34 first downs. Um, but let me tell you this. I think I, I don't really have F FCS power ratings done. But you look at Oklahoma State, who they played. Um, okay, let's see. South Dakota State was, uh, let's see, the national champion from last year, the best FCS team this year, and they're likely better than maybe 30 or 40 FBS teams, maybe even more than that. So, you know, when you look at, at the box score for Oklahoma State, 394 to 388, don't be concerned. That is an excellent team. Uh, this is a random stat, Joe, that while you were talking about Oklahoma State, I went to the database and took a look, you know, about those teams like Arkansas. I put in the database, game number two, teams that scored at least 45 points against an FCS foe and shut them out. And now they're on the road. Mm. To me, I thought those teams would have been overrated, right? You think, oh, my God, these teams are great. They beat an FCS team at home. They shut them out. They won by 45 or more points. Now they're traveling. Those teams, like Arkansas, are actually 13-4 and four ATS since 2013. That surprises me. I'm not going to base a bet on that. But, um, you know, just something to keep an eye on that even surprises me sometimes when I do go to the database. I do like Oklahoma State this year, you know, Bowman did all he had to do. I mean, I'm surprised he threw the ball 34 times. But again, yep. they played a legitimate foe, and they were challenged early. They only rushed for 3.3 yards per carry. That, to me, has them circling the wagons here. I do like Oklahoma State in this role. They do have Tulsa on deck. Yes, Tulsa is that little brother that can be annoying. But Tulsa is down quite a bit this year. And to me, even though... The stats show off an FCS shutout win. I think had Arkansas played a different opponent, this team, this game would have likely been 15 or 16. Right. So not giving too much credit to Arkansas, I still think there is value with the Cowboys. Yeah, big a big question with them is always going to be defense, but it is a work in uh, in progress here. Not so much on the offensive side of the ball again. When you return 18 starters from a year ago, that's uh that's a good sign for Oklahoma State at home. Always a tough place to play in Stillwater against an SEC opponent. All right, so we've got uh, three games uh, out of the way. We've got two big games coming up this week that we're going to get your guys' uh, thoughts on. A quick reminder: if you're joining us uh, live here on the show or on the rewatch, we certainly appreciate you doing that. Make sure. You hit that like button or follow us on Instagram and TikTok if you're hanging with us as we get ready for college football week two. And don't forget, you can visit Ralph Michaels as well as Drew Martin over at wagertalk.com. Those guys are locked and loaded, of course, for week two in college football, not to mention week one in the NFL. A lot of great reasons to go visit them over at wagertalk.com. How about the Cyhawk, man? One of the games uh, each and every year that is always a battle, and it's usually always a one-score, one-possession game. It always usually comes down to the end when Iowa State and Iowa get ready to do battle here. So, Drew, I'm going to kick it to you. I, I don't know what the hell that was in the second half with Iowa last week, but if they can carry that over into this game... There's going to be some points scored in the game here, Drew. But Iowa State, a lot of people have them as a uh, as a dark horse this year in the Big 12. How do you see this thing playing out? 
Sure, Joe. I mean, I, I can see the Hawkeyes as a dark horse. It's kind of tough to tell. You know, that's what week two college football is really all about. When some of these teams play, you know, like North Dakota, how much can you really grasp from it? Well, we're going to find out in week two. Um, you bring up the Cyhawk here, Joe. First off, I mean, in my opinion, it's the best uh, rivalry name in mm. all of sports, Cyhawk. I mean, it's, it's just bringing a lot into it. And we got to look at the Hawkeyes part of the Cyhawk. They've won seven of the last eight. So they've kind of had their number here. And you bring up the offense. I mean, just in week one, we know how bad that offense was last year. I mean, if you follow college football, I mean, Iowa's and unders and just not scoring. It's kind of their theme. But what they they had, they won 40 to nothing. I mean, scoring 40 points, something news there. And it, it, granted, it's Illinois State, so it's kind of that same theme of bringing it now to a more competitive opponent. How much does it show here? Well, they're playing at home. It's a tough place to play in Kinnick Stadium. Overall, I do like Iowa here. I think they make it eight of nine, Joe, uh, bringing the, the point spread in, the ultimate equalizer. Now, it is near a field goal. If we can get it at three, I like it a lot more. Three in the hook. Uh gets a little bit iffy because the market's telling us what 34 and a half 35 as the total points are going to be at a premium but uh what we get another 330 time slot here i think the the hawkeyes take it joe I, it's not going to be a best bet by any means for me but uh i i see him winning by maybe you know a touchdown something in that nature and uh hey let's call it maybe 27 to 20 iowa on top at home Always, and, and Drew's right, uh, Ralph. This is one of the best rivalries in all of college uh, football. It, it really, it truly is. I mean, the entire damn state seems to uh, shut down here. But these are also two teams, Ralph, that this year, there's a lot of expectations here. I mean, Iowa cracks me up every year. They keep throwing a seven and a half win total out there to start the year. And Kurt Ferentz apparently forgets. And every year, Kurt Ferentz wins 10 games, goes way over that win total. Uh, and for Matt Campbell and company, it's it's been a rough uh, couple of years, underperforming. But they really think they got a team in Iowa State. We're going to learn rather quickly. Are we not in this game? You have a decent team. A uh, couple notes to what you talked about, Joe. First, uh, let's see, probably 80% of the population of Iowa and Iowa State are on the campuses of these two teams. So the state has nothing yep. else to do but get excited Good about point. this. So, you know, <laughs> it is like, holy shit, we've, you know, mm -hmm. we got to follow this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I went through, I was going through some numbers. Uh, let's see. The second thing I want to say is we're looking at the numbers at last week's game when Iowa put up 492 yards and scored 40 points. Well, let's just fire Ference, right? He mm. was suspended last week. You know, you look at the last time they put up 492 yards when Ference was the head coach. Uh, I have to go back to 2019 wow. when they put up 644 yards against Middle Tennessee. So they have not topped this number in, in that long. But let's talk about this series. They always play game, usually game two or game three. So there's a lot on the line. Five straight unders in this series. The series, the last 11 years, 10 unders, one over. The series, the last 20 years, 18 unders, two overs. The last nine games that Iowa has hosted, not only nine straight unders, but they've gone under by 17 points per game. You can talk over under numbers all you want, but when you have a 9 and 0 over number a 9 and 0 over under record with an over under margin of minus 17 points per game, that is massive. The team split the last 2 years with the road teams winning each time, but Iowa has won 7 of 8. So Iowa State really is still the little brother, although they have a better chance to finish higher up in the Big 12 than Iowa does in the Big Ten. So I went to the database. This total is what, 35? You know, you look at a crazy total this low. This number surprised me as well. When I went back to 2010 and looked at totals of 36 or less, early in the season, games number one, two, three, four, and five, totals of 36 or less, have gone over 76% since 2010. 
when you get into the conference play and the meat of the season from game number six on, those low totals are low for a reason. They've gone under the total 69% since 2010. So early season low totals have gone over. From game five on, they have been clear underplays. I'm a big fan of this Iowa State team, and when I was doing the Gold Sheet Top 25 videos, I actually did put a small bet on Iowa State to win the Big 12. Mm. You know, you look at a quarterback in, in Becht who started off very slow as a young quarterback but truly progressed. Iowa State has their two toughest games the last two games of the season against the two Big 12 co-favorites in Utah and Kansas State. So if you're going to pay one of those long shots in the conference, play at a team with a young quarterback that has those big games later on in the season. I talked about those early game number one ads, and we talked about Iowa's offense. Listen, Iowa's offense, they played Illinois State. They scored 40 points, but I am really not that impressed with their 241 yards rushing and 6.0 yards per carry. I think this game does golf, get off to the traditional pressure-packed in-state rivalry, and I do like under in the first half, either 17 or 17 and a half. Obviously, if you could find that 17 and a half, it's a huge difference. Please do shop around. Check the Wager Talk Live odds page. It is wt.buzz backslash odds to check for those current odds. But for the show, my best bet here on the Cyhawk, first half under the 17 or 17 and a half. Uh, seeing a lot of uh, comments in the chat rooms uh, here about the under, I believe, 50 Nick bands over on Instagram has it uh, 2117. Iowa believes that Iowa's offense is better than Iowa State's. I will say this, uh, that Iowa State lost its best defender. It's uh, it's captain in linebacker there, Caleb Bacon. Lower leg injury has had surgery uh, Matt Campbell said he hopes to have him back uh, sometime towards the end of the season, but there's no guarantee. So that is a big loss on the defensive side for Iowa State. Matt Campbell also one in six against Iowa. Uh, this has not been a great spot for Matt Campbell at Iowa State, uh, and especially heading into that stadium. I think this is going to be uh, an interesting game. And was Cade McNamara what we saw in the second half? Uh, you know. Uh, just a facade, or will this continue into this game? I think it's going to be a good one for sure, but that is a ridiculously low total, and the wind ain't even blowing, Drew. It's not like they're going to have 60 miles. It's not like there is a cyclone happening in there, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how many points are put up here by Iowa, I think, in this game. The other big game that everyone is looking forward to, of course, is going to be Michigan at home taking on Texas. Uh, Ralph, I'm sure your numbers somewhere will reflect it. I know you're going to look it up, but Drew, uh, I can't remember the last time Michigan was getting more than a touchdown at home in a game. I don't care who the hell they were playing. Certainly not in the Harbaugh years, but yet here we are. Uh, I, laying seven, seven and a half with Sark. Oh, my goodness. I can't think of anything more drink worthy than watching this game and getting absolutely lit up as Sark figures out a way to screw it up. So, Drew, how are you approaching Michigan getting seven, seven and a half against Texas in this one? Yeah, what a game, Joe. I can't wait for this one. And I, I mean, you, you talk about big time matchups here. Uh, it, it, Sark being involved, laying a big number on the road and talking about just the number in itself. You know, I, I mentioned earlier, kind of like look ahead lines in college football from some of these sports books. This one's ticked up a lot after the week one performances mm. from both of these two squads. I mean, it was what, minus three and a half. Now you're laying over a touchdown with the Longhorns. That brings something into question, and it, it's kind of like week two when both teams play kind of inferior opponents and then come back to at least opponents you would think are a lot more comparable to the personnel that you have and the changes that we get. As sports bettors, that could be a great thing, in my opinion, to, to, to find more winners than losers. So on the Texas side of things, I mean, 
They're wide receivers. Everybody's talking about them. A lot of talent, likely going to be playing on Sundays. And sure enough, in week one, they went 52 to nothing over Colorado State. In Michigan, you know, we saw, uh, what, a little bit of a, a quarterback, uh, backup quarterback having to come in. Jack Tuttle getting a little bit banged up. Davis Warren uh, coming in, taking some snaps, not looking very good either. But it's something, if, if the backup has to play, a lot of times when he comes in not expecting to be the starting quarterback, Joe, it's almost like, particularly in week one, it's almost like you're not ready. It's like you're drinking out of a fire hose. When you go back, you get a week of practice. A lot of times we'll see that same athlete come out and play a little bit better. That's something I've learned in sports betting. Don't just take one week to the next in surprises like that. That's something pointing towards Michigan. And they got a good defense, no doubt about it. I mean, that defensive line is stout. So if you're looking to stop a Texas offense, the best way to do so is get pressure on the quarterback. I think Michigan can actually have some success doing that. Now, obviously, this, the, the betting market's not liking uh, the Wolverines here. Only a 25-yard edge week one against Fresno State. But the defense, you know, it, it could be good enough to kind of like keep them in these games and, and win these games, even with quarterback uh, kind of questions. And sure enough, their new defensive quarterback, uh, defensive coordinator, Don Martindale, uh, he, he comes from the Baltimore Ravens. And uh, I, I wouldn't doubt that Michigan's going to have a heck of a defense this season. In terms of Texas, a lot of people liking them, but one in eight against the spread against Big 10 opponents, 0-7 against the spread as a favorite. Got that from the Mark Lawrence uh, newsletter. So, hey, if you're looking to lay a big a big number here with the Longhorns, that's something to kind of pump the brakes. And talked about the line movement over the touchdown. Hey, I actually think this is one of those spots, Joe, where not a lot of people are going to be liking it. It's kind of one of those ugly ones. But how about this home team catching more than a touchdown against the Texas team that looks sharp week one? Hey, I think this is a situation for it. I think this is an ugly one. Big time matchup in the big house. Tough place to play. Uh, it, it, it's going to be loud. And I think Texas actually kind of struggles a little bit. So give me seven in the hook with the home dog barking, Joe. Eric D in the chat. Uh, also uh, taking the uh, points with Michigan uh, in this one. Drew, right on there with you. Yeah, you get old Wink Martindale back in the uh, old uh, Don Marty there on the defensive side for Michigan. A Michigan team, Ralph, by the way, that only returned five starters from last year, and I think one of them was the punter, uh, which is hilarious. But yet, that defense is for real. And, and let's face it, no offense to Colorado State, but going into the big house, taking on a Big Ten defense like this, I, I don't know if the market is just overvaluing Texas, maybe undervaluing uh, Michigan, it feels like this is a big number to carry, Ralph. Uh, I, I don't know if you have it. When the hell's the last time Michigan was getting more than a touchdown at home against anybody? Uh, it feels like this is also going to be a lower scoring game. Are you, do you think that? Because look at this total. Well, Joe, I'm going to, you deserve a Miller Lite, and mm -hmm. I, I am happy to buy you a Miller Lite because you you did an A-plus plus job as the host, mm -hmm. letting me know what to go to the database before you went to Drew, so I appreciate that. So, <laughs> my database goes back to 1990. I'm going to put you on the spot, Joe. Since 1990, and again, that's a long time mm -hmm. to think back, how many times has Michigan been a home dog of more than five? Uh Right, I can't. It doesn't come to mind. It can't even uh, once, maybe. Well, let me let, let me let me call you out for a minute. You got to remember those back to back to back Ohio State years. They were a home dog in all yes. those roles. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, so, yes, okay. But besides besides Ohio State, they've been a home dog twice of more than five since 1990. Jesus. In 2008. Mm -hmm. They were a five and a half point home dog to Wisconsin. They beat them outright. And in 2020, they were a seven point home dog to Wisconsin. They lost that game 49 to 11. Mm. So they're one and one in that role. If you add in the Ohio State games as a home dog since 1990, they're actually five, two and one, 71.4%. Now, there's a lot that I liked what Drew said. Drew did a great job breaking down this game. And 
everyone in this business, be it a, a fan, a handicapper, or a better, there is no bigger week in college football than week number two with the big O overreactions. And that's exactly what this is. All summer long, Texas was three. They went to three and a half. They got some love. They went to four. Michigan struggles in one game. Texas comes out and shuts out Colorado State 52 to nothing. And that's a three-point adjustment on this game. That's something that I will never, ever mm. bet into. I don't mind betting a line move, you know, if it just happens and it progresses and, and there's still value. But if you're betting into a line move because of a week one overreaction, that is something that is going to cost you your entire bankroll as you continue to move forward. I like this Texas team. I like Quinn Ewers. Yeah, you were 74% home against Colorado. You know, you ran the ball for almost 200 yards and 4.6 yards per carry. You know, but you had a 26 to 11 first down edge. You know, on the flip side, Michigan got out gained in the first half. Yes, they had a pick six touchdown, which, you know, gave them one less possession. But still, a couple things that I looked at. In a way, favorite in game number two versus a top 20 team. Remember, Michigan is still ranked. They're ranked number 10. So home dogs in game number two that are a top 20 team are 16 and 11 against the spread. Another situation to back Michigan. Teams that are a home dog and they're a top 10 team have actually covered 67% against the spread. Mm. And how about this? Since 2020, yes, we have a new coach. Yes, we have a new DC. But there's still a lot that gets transferred over from one season to the next. Michigan, with a low total of 49 or less, as simply that, when Michigan has a total of 49 or less, they are 15 and two against the spread. Oof. That is 88%. I think this is an overreaction. I did a Texas video this summer saying I do like the Longhorns against Michigan laying the three or three and a half. It's completely moved out of the realm of not even liking Texas to actually flipping sides to the Wolverines. If you ever have had the mentality or have you ever heard about a defensive home dog, this is the example of that. I lean with Michigan, and yes, if you watched the Texas video over the summer, I said I like Texas, but I've given you all the reasons why you're allowed to change your mind, and that's what you do as an astute better. Well, and, and listen, we also know um... – Ralph and uh, Drew, we know that week two in college football is the week of complete overreactions, uh, and the market does it. Some teams getting too much credit, some teams not getting enough credit. Usually, this is the week, this and next week, uh, Drew, are the weeks in which <laughs> you can really capitalize and build that bankroll by looking at uh, at looking at some teams that are just getting way too much credit and some teams that may not have looked apart last week uh and the market is completely uh flipping on him so usually week two and three drew is where you look to find those spots and and hammer away and have a good time and build up the bankroll here for college football absolutely joe i i, I second that i mean a lot of what ralph said and, and what you're talking about right now is you know week two in college football i would actually put it like week two to about week seven or eight in college mm -hmm. football I actually think is the best time to bet the sport of football, Joe. And, and some of the reason is because not a lot of people know know a lot about these teams. So if you could really dig in deep on and find some of these teams that are undervalued, that's a great way to win and just kind of ride them week two, week three, week four. And then the market starts to kind of realize it. And then by like week nine or 10, hey, it's it, most of the values already kind of sipped out. But go back the last five or six years in college football, guys, there are multiple teams that go like the first eight weeks of the college football season and go six and two, seven and one ATS. It yeah. is it, it happens each and every year. So if you can find one of them, say, starting in week two here, that just kind of even if they're losing, but they're staying within the, the, the point spread. Actually, that's that a lot of times that's better. 
you know, if you can find a team that's like three and three, yet six and oh against the spread, that's one of my best profiles to bet, Joe. It's just because nobody talks about those teams. Mm -hmm. And week two to week eight in college football, man, uh, this is a prime time to be a sports better and find more winners than losers. I agree 100%. I, I will say this is the uh, this is the weeks, the next couple of weeks where those uh, money line dog parlays come into play uh, in college football. Just saying, especially the old round robins here, you know, take five, take four, take three, take two. Uh, it is a good time of year if you can find those spots in which – the dogs are very much alive in college football. The one thing, uh, Ralph, that I want to address because I love, I love our uh, our our peeps in the chat room here. But if I watch somebody, if I see somebody else post how they're teasing college football totals, I'm going to throw up. Uh, I listen. I am for anything. Listen, have fun with it. Not everyone is looking to be a professional handicapper. I get it. Enjoy it, but. I will tell you this, and Ralph, back me up if I'm, or tell me if I'm wrong. I can't think of a more a bigger sport with bigger variance on a week to week basis than trying to tease college football totals in any way, shape, or form. I think is just a losing proposition. Have fun with it. But my goodness, Ralph, I can't think of anything worse than trying to think that a six-point teaser in a college football total is somehow going to move the needle one way or the other for me. Joe, um, I have bet maybe seven college football teasers in my life that included a total. <laughs> and I guarantee you that all seven – have been in the Army Navy game taking the dog and the under. So again, when you're talking a total of 34 and you're teasing it, that's yeah. completely different than taking a total of 70 and teasing it. So um, you know, if, if someone came to me and said, "Hey, I really want to tease Iowa State in the under," I would say, "Okay, that may be the only instance this week or for the next four weeks that I would say that may not be the dumbest bet you make." But there's two things that I want to mention real quick. Drew made some great points, but when you are trying to chase a streak, if you have a team that's won five straight and they're five and OATS, you know what? Vegas has adjusted the line. When you have a team that has gotten crushed, has lost five straight by 50 points per game, they're 0 and 5 ATS, Vegas has, has adjusted the line. The true value is finding an ATS streak where a team is maybe only 500 straight up or a huge negative streak where the team is maybe 500 straight up. Those are the situations where you are getting true value betting an ATS streak relative to a straight up record. And one last thing, just so we're taking some time and helping people become better betters this year. One thing I do love looking at is SEC teams that roll through their non-conference schedule putting up 40 or 50 points per game. Listen, when you're playing your SEC opener, your offense changes 100%. So mm. I look at high-scoring SEC teams when they're playing that first SEC game, you're not going to be as cute. You're going to be conservative. You're going to run the ball. You're not going to go for it on fourth down in you know near midfield. All of those things add up to early conference season unders with those high scoring games. So great point, Drew. I just wanted to add on to it and keep a look when people are playing those first conference games off a huge non-conference schedule. A lot of other uh, interesting totals on the board with the Duke Blue Devils and Northwestern being another one of those teams where first one to 14 wins. Uh, at least that's what the market thinks is that total is hovering around 36, 35, 37, somewhere in that ballpark there with two quality defenses and maybe not the greatest offenses here. Another low total without weather, I think, playing. And I mean, we're still in September and we're still getting totals, Drew, in the mid-30s here. little shocking for week two of college football that we're looking at some totals that are happening Right in the mid-30 number here, and, and we got no snowstorms, wind, or anything else that's going on right now in college football. 
Yeah, th th that's a great point. I mean, w watching the weather for sure, and, and and we are only in the month of September, so things will change once we get to you know late yeah. October and November. Um, but I, I will say, you know, it was something I noticed in week one is that Northwestern kind of uh, what interim stadium there that's right yeah. on the lake, and yeah. some sometimes there can be wind. I know just from betting Northwestern games in the past, but maybe with that stadium, I, I didn't notice that there was not. Uh, you know, stands on the side. So for that wind to blow, I got to do a little bit more research on that. But I'll tell you, Joe, in that one, I mean, Friday night lights, getting the weekend off started. Yep. I know there's an NFL game on Friday that a lot of people will be watching, but that's a great one, a high IQ bowl. And Duke's really struggled against the Elon Phoenix. That's a game that I, I watched a lot. I don't know if they were holding back. I don't think so. You know, they lost their head coach, new quarterback. And Northwestern looks strong, looks strong on defense. So I actually think this number is short. And Northwestern minus two and a half. Actually, some of the more key shops uh, in the global marketplace already to three. Um, I think Northwestern's worth a bet here, Joe. I, I think that number's short at two in the hook. I, I, Drew, I'm with you. I mean, I thought Northwestern's defense did a great job against the, the Red Hawks, 267 total yards. Uh, you mentioned Elon. I mean, listen, it's Manny Diaz. Ralph, we yeah. always know Manny Diaz is going to, you know, Drew, Drew and I both know that. He's going to bring the defense. You got to think uh, the Duke defense is certainly <laughs> going to show up and show out. Only 140 yards uh, for Elon. They do have, I believe, uh, the kid that transferred from Texas, uh, the Malik Murphy, I believe is the uh is the qb now for duke it's gonna take a little bit of time there for the duke blue devil offense to kind of get acclimated but uh you know drew brings up a good point this is a low total for a reason here ralph it would not shock me uh if this thing barely gets uh to the mid 30s here because it does kind of feel like the first one to 17 is going to win yeah, well, you're giving Manny Diaz a lot of credit. Remember, these are still the Duke players on defense. Um, yeah. I will say this. I went to the database. It does show wins 18 to 19 up to 25 miles an hour Friday oh. at in, in Chicago. And there as you go. Said, you know, um, yeah. you know, the lacrosse team that plays on that field may be able to outscore the Northwestern Wildcats this week. We'll see what happens. I'm kind of with you there. Uh, SB all over Northwestern in this game uh, might be a little uh, a little light there, Drew. I'm kind of with you. I mean, this is a game we have seen Northwestern be pretty darn good at uh, here. At home, Friday night light should be a good one uh, as they get ready here for week two in college football and don't forget guys opportunity to be able to hop on board with ralph or drew over on their pages at wagertalk.com right now both guys locked loaded ready to go here for week two in college football we got nfl both these guys locked and loaded there and let's not forget of course uh we still have to finish out the regular season in major league baseball I would highly encourage you guys to check out uh, Drew's Daily Diamond. That video posted each and every morning. If you haven't seen it already, the link is in the description for those of you joining us on YouTube here. And Ralph, what else you got rolling here over at Wager Talk? You know, I just wanted to mention, um, you know, we have, a shirt, we have a Thursday show this week and a Friday show. And we really wanted to say thank you to everyone that does tune in and watch this college football show. I have a special that is valid only for Drew, for me, and the three guys on tomorrow's show with you, Joe, Brian, Steve Merrill, and Teddy. Mm. You can use the code CFB99. That will not be advertised anywhere else to get 30 days of college football from any of the five of us for just $99. Go to my page, Drew's page, or again, Brian, Leonard, Steve, or Teddy, code CFB99, four weeks, 30 days, college football, $99. Can't go wrong. CFB 99. Utilize it, guys. Take advantage of it right now. Hop on board. Partner up with these guys for what is no doubt going to be a huge, and I mean huge, uh, week in college football. Week two, it is time to build that bankroll. If it was a rough week one, don't worry about it. Week two is here and plenty of opportunities 
to hop on board and to build up that bankroll here as football season is back. We'll be back, of course, again tomorrow. Another edition. Merrill, Brian Leonard, and the crew will be here. We'll be breaking down five more big games coming up in week two. On behalf of Ralph and Drew, though, we appreciate the, the time. As always, don't forget to hit that like button and make sure you come back and join us. Another edition of the College Football Kickoff Show 24 hours from now. Until then, cash those tickets tonight, guys. We'll see you again soon.